There we go. Hey, hey, Drew, we're live now. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us, and I'm sure multiple will join um, as we as we kind of like uh, get started here. A um, few things uh, to uh, housekeeping items, I guess, is like the cool way of saying it. it is um, this is going to be recorded? That's the number one uh, webinar slash session question. Um, we also have a feature that we encourage everyone to use in the chat. So um, what you can do is ask questions. You can use an emoji to to um, vote them up and we'll address those at the end there's also this cool feature which i can click and the questions will show at the bottom of the panel here so that's nice and um, convenient for highlighting the question that we uh we pick um and yeah without further ado um let's uh let's get into things so happy to welcome drew noel here vp of revenue at scs cloud um, also, lots of like great experience um, and something that's very near and dear to my heart from uh, being at Mad Kudu. So I know Drew has been up to a lot of stuff and uh, and uh, great to have you here, Drew. So thanks so much for joining. Um, no, pleasure, Kevin. Great to be here. Yeah, ha happy to join you all. Uh, you know, really, really cool uh, to have just Danny reach out and like connect all of us and, you know, Hype, hype to be here, happy to take everybody through some of the common plays and uh, various requirements in terms of just setting up your data structure, architecture, et cetera, to you know, make sure that you can actually play the product-led growth game. Yeah, yeah, shout out to Danny too. Uh, Danny's um, in, the, in the behind the scenes moderating and uh, is uh, helping with all the connections and stuff. So, so uh, we, love, we love Danny here. Um, uh, I guess one thing to just start before we like jump into um, just kind of like visual stuff is just like, I think it's good to set context for everyone is just kind of get your origin story, like how you got into this like world. I feel like it's usually some sort of a circuitous route, especially with like data architecture type stuff. So maybe you could uh, uh, talk about that for a little bit before uh, jumping into the, the presentation. Sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, well, it's, it's very interesting. I, I got into, so I was originally a, a an AE and also a, uh, I, I had did a short stint in telephone sales, like, you know, as kind of an SDR type role in my very, very early career. Um, and then I uh, was an AE with a, you know, in-person sales territory, uh, fresh out of college. And then I got into marketing. I studied marketing uh, and, and sales, you know, in terms of business. And I've, I'm one of the, weird people who's actually always done what I studied. So, um, you know, kind of went into marketing and, and got uh, some experience with database marketing and direct response marketing. And that's kind of how I learned operations overall, measurement, and then um, probably how I got into the, the, the depths of it was I was running corporate marketing at a media company and, uh, you know, just a, a mid-market media company. And, and we hired Blue Wolf, which was a, a mm -hmm. Salesforce consulting firm that mm -hmm. was originally eventually purchased by IBM. Um, and they came in, implemented Salesforce and kind of left us with a bunch of random fields and duplication data. Things, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Been there before. And I was like, I was like, okay. So uh yeah, I, I that's when I was like, all right, well, I'm gonna dig in and and learn the CRM. And from there I learned CRM, MAP, uh really like more than anything was in marketing ops, um, and then expanded into sales ops. And you know, in my role at Madkudu was uh in a professional services and advisory role for our clients and helping them with product-led growth, um, modern data stack, and a number of considerations there. So uh, that, that being a PS role and also, you know, overlapping with customer success to a large degree. And now, you know, combining all of those in my current role at SES Cloud, where we're consulting on revenue operations and also financial operations. Mm and making sure that those play well together and the office of the CFO and the CRO are actually, uh, you know, really aligned in terms of the go-to-market strategy. So that's, yeah. that's what I do today. I feel like, yeah, I feel like that's a question we'll probably want to get into like later is this like, okay, the evolution of like the different ops roles. Cause I feel like back when I was doing marketing ops, like 
12 years ago plus uh they were just like yeah. it was pretty much just like a marketo monkey is like you know make sure that these things flow to the right places but it's not like strategic around like guiding the business for anything so i feel like it's much in a much better place now and like uh it's it's kind of evolved to you know having more receipt at the table for marketing ops and then becoming revenue ops and like how it connects to finance and all the stuff but maybe we can get into that a little bit later um i sure. know you have a uh i know you have like uh just kind of a like a precursor to like share with people, like just kind of um, around how to do this PLG thing and how to make sense of it and, and maybe some like interesting uh, plays that we can get into. So I'll, I'll let you take over and uh, share your screen. Um, and yeah, awesome. I'll just go to that. Yeah. Well, let's go. All right, cool team. So uh, let me share my screen and should be able to see it now. Yeah, it looks good. Awesome. All right, cool. So, uh, you know, really more than anything, we're going to talk about using data to inform PLG. And I'm going to walk you through uh, some some data about, and just if you wanted to call out like a little bit more of a background here, um, super hardcore cyclist outside of work. So uh, I actually uh, run a podcast called The Revenue Riders. Uh, and uh, with uh, the head of growth at Live Data Technology, it's Jason Saltzman. Uh, who's actually an ex-pro cyclist. Uh, and, you know, we really, like, more than anything, I think the ops role combined with, uh, and the revenue role combined with, you know, cycling or endurance sport overall, uh, it's all about metrics and marginal gains and optimization. So I like to call that out in terms of the balance between my work and personal life. So let's talk about PLG, right? It's technical, first and foremost, because you are really looking at the data stream coming from your product um, and how the product is organized and aligned and the features within that product are being used by users uh, and also accounts overall. It's tactical because you have specific plays and motions that you have to go through and operational structures that need to be established in order to provide for that cadence or that communication. And then also it's strategic. So in terms of how exactly those plays are aligned in order to bring about revenue at specific points in time, how exactly uh, you are able to expand the plays that you're doing based off of the product data that is uh, informing those plays. And then also, I think we'll see at the, in the last part, I do, do want to get back to ICP and just talk about very quickly the overlap of ICP combined with product-led approaches and how that can actually inform product strategy as well. So you actually get a full closed loop in terms of uh, your approach to product-led growth. So let's talk about architecture. It's not really so much about how, but it's why and where. So, you know, how you leverage the tech stack is a lot less important than, you know, getting the data to the right place. Um, more than anything, I mean, you're probably using a data warehouse solution that may be Snowflake or Redshift, most commonly. Uh, you may have a CDP and you're doing orchestration with that. Uh, you're doing I identity resolution on your website. You're maybe pulling that data through and making sure that all of the activities on the web or in the product are being consolidated. Uh, you also have the possibility that you're using an aggregation or scoring platform, similar to Common Room or like myself being at Magkudu. And there's a lot of other players in the market there as well. Um, but I wanted to call out this point is that, you know, you don't necessarily need to use a CDP or an orchestration tool, and you don't necessarily need to use an aggregation or scoring tool. You could use one or the other, right? And really more than anything, you're looking to segment and to aggregate the activities and count the activities that users and accounts are doing or performing within your product, right? Ultimately, that's going to be put back into the CRM. Most of the time, it might go back into the data warehouse. I mean, there's a lot of debate or discussion these days around, oh, well, is the, tr you know, the, the source of truth or the single source of truth really the data warehouse or is it your CRM? I think for most sales organizations, most go-to-market organizations, it's still the CRM. But at the same time, in a lot of product-led organizations that are, I would say, fully mature in terms of being product-led, you do see them 
going to the data warehouse directly as the full source of truth, or they're using the data from the data warehouse and using a reverse ETL solution in order to pipe those aggregations or uh, computations that they've established back into the CRM. So that being said, what what exactly do you get from that? And this slide is, uh, I apologize for the small text, but you know, in terms of for formatting, uh, it seemed to work the best here. But you know, at the lead level, you have the creation of a product qualified lead potentially, right? And you know, there's a debate of like, well, you know, our PQLs or MQLs are dead, or you know, they don't necessarily give you a an account specific approach. And no, they don't. But you could potentially have a number of product qualified leads in terms of individuals who are using the product at a level of high intent and then having those surfaced and associated to the account and effectively rolling that data up to a product qualified account, right? So you could have inbound and outbound motions facilitated by product led approaches or product led data uh, that are surfaced and established within the CRM at those different object levels. There's also the aspect of a specific user type being surfaced, right? And maybe a segmentation around what that user persona might be even. And didn't call that out specifically here, but a persona is an extension um, in terms of what role do they play within the organization? What role do they play within the buying committee? And that's called out as well in terms of the outbound approach, really identifying buying committee members based on their activity within the product based on their segmentation or their resolution to persona definitions. Um, and then also at the contact level, the uh, just account coverage overall, right? There's an aspect of going outbound where if you see that different personas are using the product in different ways, or they're using the product in a way that doesn't necessarily normally align to the persona involved in that product, uh, you may want to establish a separate play or treat that individual in a different way or establish your overall account map uh, in a different way as you really reconcile product-led growth with product-led sales, right? Especially when you have an enterprise motion. Um, and that also leads to expansion, right? So there may be scenarios where you have expansion plays around consolidation and we'll get into this in the plays section as well i, I do have it called out uh, where you have individuals who may be using a lower tier or a free user account and you want to consolidate those into the overall enterprise account and make sure that their feature sets are are upgraded and that also that account is consolidated so that you can more effectively control a an enterprise account right if that is a, an appropriate scenario for your product, your company, and how you're designing the go-to-market approach there. Cool. Any questions? Just wanted to pause and see if there was anything in the chat that had come up so far. Um, yeah, I I'm looking at my my slides and just wanted to check. No, I didn't want to interrupt, but um, and I, I haven't seen stuff coming through the chat. And like anyone who's uh, on, please uh, feel free to chat some questions in. Um, but I am curious, like. Uh, just like if there's like a rule of thumb for like, I think a lot of people are curious about like, how do I take my PLG motion and like move it to PLS? So I was, question that always comes up is like, you know, what is a good like uh, rule of thumb for like when you should start to engage with a with a s enterprise account? Like maybe you'll get into that. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, wh wh where do people even get started of like, how do we make this motion, like test it out to see if it's going to work? I think I think it really depends on, you know, your your core users, right? A great example that I think a lot of people like to look at is like a, a darling example, like Miro, right? So Miro has a lot of product users or product designers or, um, you know, also sometimes project managers who are using that platform. Um, and there, they might be looking at an overall zeitgeist or or critical mass within the account overall, right? Before they engage uh, with the account from a product-led sales perspective. Now, I'll also speak to my experience at HashiCorp, 
where you know we were doing something uh, very similar to what Common Room can facilitate with um, community-led growth, right? And looking at the analytics around that, we were looking at the engagement on our website and in our, our forums and communities and using that as almost a, a uh, I would say, a, a proxy, right? Mm -hmm. for, for product engagement or product interest. And so if there were specific posts about specific product features on the open source level, then you could possibly score around, you know, intent, um, you know, based on that activity. So, however, we had a much higher threshold there because the primary persona that we were dealing with was a developer. And as we all know, when your primary audience are developers, you don't necessarily want to go after them in a very aggressive approach, right? So really where you set that threshold really has a lot to do with who your primary audience is and who your decision makers are. And that would then inform the potential uh, modeling and, and cutoff level or trigger level where you would actually engage the account from a product-led sales perspective or pr product-led yeah. sales perspective. That I think you can also... Yeah, 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 for sure. I think you can also kind of like add a some like tangible example to that as well. Um, on the on the um, top of funnel or like uh, kind of community based intent side of things where it's like you might have a lot of hands on practitioners, like especially in like the developer space that are like actually active and using your product. And then the economic buyer is, you know, not anywhere near that, but they might follow you, they might follow a competitor, they might like join your community. and we find it like that is like a pretty good proxy of like, this is a account that's like actually considering or like uh, has, has the right kind of intent because that economic buyer other person is just like, I'm going to check this thing out because my team is using it. So there's lots of uh, like kind of like combinations of things that help bolster this like account overall account score. That means like they're now in market for your sales team to like reach out to. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why, you know, you, you wouldn't necessarily just go with a PQA or a PQL using those two in tandem, right? And and looking at the way in which individual users are escalating their engagement or intent, but also looking at the profiling of individual personas and then tracking that and rolling that up to the account level is super critical, right? So you wanna really be able to look at it uh, at both levels. Yeah, it kind of like what's your, your point of like put, uh, you know, using a CRM as almost like the source of truth is like, it, just looking at the product data doesn't tell the whole picture. So, you know, putting all, like, aggregating everything into the, what's happening at the account level in a CRM, like paints more of the picture, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool. Okay. We can move on. Sorry for diverging. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. No, it's great. We're, 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 we're uh, riffing. I love yeah, riffing. Nice. Cool. Um, so I did want to call out, you know, this is an interesting point and especially for uh, individuals or companies that, are kind of like, well, we don't have that level of data yet, or we aren't necessarily running all of our motions around product led. Um, I think one thing to call out is the types of product led growth that exist uh, in the market. And, you know, those, those might be um, product led trial, right, as the very like beginning of that motion. So if you have a, a trial that's actually being monitored in terms of product interaction, uh, you can also, you know, work with your organization to establish that. You know, working with product management across marketing, sales, and customer success to see how those motions really run, and of course, the operations organization that supports all of those. Um, and then, you know, expanding from there, you might have a single product that might be product led, and this is kind of how we we played it at HashiCorp, right? Is that we established products that were uh, product led products like Terraform Cloud in relationship to Terraform uh, on-prem or Terraform, uh, you know, open source, right? So you have different levels of the ability to do product-led uh, motions based on monitoring the product interaction, depending on how you actually manage your product portfolio. And I think that this is an interesting tie back between the go-to-market organization and why in product-led growth, right, the product team is really the, the starting point of that organization. Uh, and, you know, it's really considered part of the go-to-market organization as opposed to necessarily 
the engineering or delivery org. Um, interested, Kevin, from your perspective, there's a, a different opinion, or you know, if you you would agree with that. No, no, I, th I think you know. I hate to say like it depends, but like I feel like every every company is yeah, has their own you know bespoke way of like identifying like which which step and like what uh which step or which like motion to go with um i i was actually curious like with HashiCorp and having like open source as being part of the mix like how if, if you were able to how you thought about like the open source side of things if you're like you know sifting through github to see like if there's activity there or um if that was just something where it's like we know this will grow organically over time and then like when they're ready they'll like move into um like raise their hand and, and, and use our like hosted service uh or hosted solution I, I feel like that's always a challenge yeah. for open source companies that like they're trying to crack is like how do we get these open source users to know that we exist yeah absolutely and i think that that is you know what i spoke to is really the the community engagement aspect right because if they would you know if they were to potentially download that on GitHub and then they were using it there, right? The, the repo existed and then they would maybe go and um, work with uh, like go into the community and then use their, let's say off zero login, right? And then you could potentially reconcile that to say, okay, yes, they're using the product, they're in the community, they're now asking certain questions or they're providing feedback around different aspects of using the product so effectively they end up uh you can use that community level engagement as a proxy for particular product intent right so yeah. that yeah. that's an interesting way to reconcile it yeah and cool. another um and oh yeah go oh. ahead oh i was just gonna um ask if you've seen any trends because this is kind of like a like there's a spectrum of what product-led growth means uh, from freemium to like PLS, product-led sales. Um, I'm wondering if you are seeing any trends because uh, of, of people kind of skipping the transactional side of things and just going straight from like freemium to product-led sales or or maybe just in general, like what trends you're seeing as you're like talking with a lot of companies written on the consultant side of things. Yeah, I mean, I would say the, I will, I can't say that there's enough of a sample there to say that there's an overall trend, right? But I think more and more with the aspect of decentralized purchasing not really being permitted to a large degree, right? Right now, in terms of the macroeconomic conditions, yeah, um, you definitely see downward pressure to a certain degree on uh, sort of decentralized approaches around product-led growth. So the product-led product aspect, I think really ha has been pushed down, whereas the product-led trial is still absolutely a relevant approach because of course you're able to give the end user a sample of how they would potentially do that and then identifying how to potentially do product-led sales. So I think that middle step is the most likely to be um, somewhat squashed currently given the greater control of CFOs, the the downward pressure on decentralized purchasing. And then, you know, I think the product led trial versus product led company, that that motion is still very likely to exist. The problem there is that if you don't have enough zeitgeist within the overall account, you don't have that critical mass. You know, mm -hmm. are you really going to be able to make a business case? Right. And that's one of the biggest things that we see in the current uh, economic climate is selling with a strong business case is one of the most important aspects of selling, um, especially when you present that to in terms of metrics and and you know proof of potential uh, for the CFO. Yeah, well, I'm really glad I asked because like I didn't I haven't even thought about that of just pressure of efficiency and maybe like taking back people's like ramp or brex cards yeah. so that they can't self-serve <laughs> yeah, totally. is, is is causing people to not do but not have uh, that product led growth motion um or that's like you know hitting ceilings or, or flattening off very very interesting hypothesis there <laughs> yeah cool yeah um absolutely. no cool we can, yeah, we just, can uh, move on yeah go ahead yeah i just you wanted to give uh, a couple of common plays and i mean again like a lot of these slides are like large grids and you know there's a lot to read through here but you know i'm happy to provide the slides and if anybody reaches out um you know happy to happy to you know pass those along um 
also hit me up on LinkedIn and, you know, happy to, happy to share. Um, we did want to call out Dave Rigotti and Peter Kirk because they covered this last week uh, at Mopsapalooza and that kind of brought it top of mind for me. Um, and of course, uh, you know, worked reasonably closely with Peter Kirk um, when he was at Lucid and also uh, now he's at Night Kudu. So uh, shout outs there. Uh, props where props is due. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, um, both those people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah cool. Great. Great, great folks. Um, also, uh, let's let's get into plays, right? Because you know when we when we design plays, some of the stuff that we want to do is is make sure that we're taking the the data that we're seeing in the product, and then as we actually establish a particular trigger around the data architecture that we have, right? It, we're able to make a play that makes sense right and a great example i mean just at the various stages with within driving revenue right whether that be an assist play to move them towards uh towards conversion or just assist in the onboarding of the initial free trial um specifically driving them toward conversion on the convert play um expanding right or making sure that you know they're taking advantage of additional product features etc um and then also consolidating as we talked about moving free or lower tier users into a higher tier account and consolidating there which would effectively increase the overall arr of the account um and then also like focusing on defending or or doing churn prevention um a lot of different plays here i think what's what's cool is like i was able to kind of take this and like call out some of the things that you would need to specifically model on um, and that's primarily around conversion and expansion, right? Where you actually play in your PQL or PQA modeling um, and the thresholds that are relevant there. Um, and then also, you know, just the plays themselves, right? Just making sure that, you know, if you have, um, if they're, if you have particular product features, right, this is the classic PLG example is like, okay, well, once they get into the product and they've maybe used it a little bit, if they're not using certain features or you feel like there's a feature that maps potentially to uh, conversion and you can do that using modeling platforms or scoring platforms, right? You can actually establish those correlations. And then again, that let's, let's talk, candidly about that very quickly because some people will be like well correlation is not causation well you know you can do uh, a pretty clean regression if you have a significant amount of data and that's really the beauty of high volume product-led uh, motions right is that you have a ton of data you can potentially do a but if you don't have a ton of sales right maybe you don't have that initially right you don't have a correlation because you don't have a huge sample of sales so think about it that way and make sure that, you know, maybe if you need to just establish an arbitrary cutoff or an evaluation of, you know, a specific rule set or heuristic, you could potentially take that approach and make sure that you're triggering off your actions based off of that instead of necessarily modeling it. So again, a lot here, but, you know, wanted to speak to it generally. And then of course, you know, you can read the details from the deck. Yeah. When there isn't like a high volume of sales to there's maybe like a high volume of activity, but not a high volume of sales. Is there like other leading indicators that you've seen um, work well that are maybe higher volume, like a meeting set or a uh, credit card added or I, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling. Yeah. With yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in terms of the self-serve conversion, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You can you can look at that. Right. And if you have that in, you know, a a uh, in an orchestration or a CDP, like you can you can use that as the potential target of the model. Um, you can also look at. Uh, maybe it's a specific additional activity if there's a high volume of that. Right. So depending on what you have available and your level of maturity in terms of how long you've been in market, how long, you know, how many users you actually have, what your level of adoption is generally, uh, you can potentially scale back the targets and look at 
you know, sort of those initial uh, actions that people take and then map that to kind of those aha moments that people may have within the product um, or that you're seeking for them to have, right? And see what the correlations are there. Yeah. Cool. Um, so let's talk about less common signals in play because I think this was kind of the promise of the webinar. Uh, and it was it, it's interesting because uh, I actually have directly encountered a, a number of these. And uh, I think what's fascinating is that, you know, yeah, like if you have decreased login frequency, it may result in, you know, a drop off in engagement. I mean, that's sort of the, the like basic classic example of a less common signal, right, is looking at the negative signal as opposed to positive signals. Um, and then potentially nurturing or uh, looking for incentives to get people to log in, uh, you know, doing uh, out of product nurture as opposed to in product nurture uh, or messaging, things of that nature. And then uh, looking at advanced features, I think is an interesting thing to consider because if they're, if they're consistently using uh, high level features that may map to your product strategy, right? If they're using a feature that's mapped to a higher tier feature uh, in an account, then you may okay. want. I found this on the oh, web. Right there. Triggered Siri. <laughs> Siri. Siri is randomly going off on me. I was like, hello. Um, but you may want to look at the use it, the the map of an advanced feature in the available tier that they're on and how that maps to a more enterprise tier or maybe pro tier compared to what what they're paying for and then see how those features may relate so if they start to use a more complex feature how does that potentially relate to an upsell or a tier upgrade um, and how you can message around that effectively. So that really does come down to, you know, not just product-led growth, but product management, right? And what your product roadmap and what your product tiering strategy uh, looks like. And, you know, the other day I was even, you know, I was writing a post on LinkedIn about uh, just CPQ. And that's a really interesting aspect of making sure that the product map and the product tiering strategy makes sense so that you can drive additional value and provide that additional incremental value in terms of tier upgrade um, or feature set. Kevin, what do you think on that? Yeah. Uh, on um, on the just like uh, CPQ? Uh, no, no, the, the, the mapping of product features in terms of, you know, making sure that that is coherent and how that relates back and, you know, balancing yeah. the product development approach with the actual product led uh motions that you're doing yeah i try i tend to think of it in like how does your how does the value of the products like uh, tie to user behavior and like what i mean by I use like miro as an example of like okay the value of miro is not like single player mode you know building a you know whiteboard it's like the collaboration no. piece of it right so it's like okay how do we map like this signal is like okay people are getting value out of the product because there's multiple users in miro um I'm, I'm assuming this is like one of the things that they they track for you know is this actually adding value or not and then that kind of informs like you know is this a product qualified lead or you know product qualified account or not um whereas other like other um uh, other product-led companies are maybe like okay are they adding a advanced uh, so, or like a paid software like Snowflake or Snails, Salesforce or something like that as an integration. So uh, to me, it's just, it just kind of depends on like what uh, what value or like what are people trying to do with the products. Um, and it vastly diff it differs between like, you know, where, like how the product is built and like what it's being used for. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting point that you call out around the integrations too, right? Because though, you know, as people establish integrations, if they're, core integrations and you also want to be able to potentially look at the the data volume that's following that's flowing through those integrations because if the data volume is really low well that's not as sticky and it's not necessarily as core to the functionality of their overall stack right and therefore it's like it's easier for them to potentially rip out the product that you know you're you're promoting to them or selling to them so 
you know, if you're able to look at not just the fact that the integration exists, but also the flow of data through that integration, I think that's an additional potential metric that doesn't necessarily resolve at the like specific product level in terms of clicks or interactions, but it really does have to do with the data pipe. Um, and so that's a completely different level of data that you would want to potentially analyze, um, you know, around those integrations if you wanted to get more advanced about it. Yeah. I'm curious if you, uh, you kind of like reminded me of something that we, we saw at retool, which is like kind of a counter counterintuitive example. And I wonder if you have any counterintuitive signals that show intent and the, the example that I always yeah. uh, use for retools, like, okay, we had this behavior of like someone would sign up, be super active for like two weeks and then just like completely drop off. And uh -huh. we're like, that's, that's a weird behavior, but we found that that was like the enterprise motion behavior because they like wanted to to use the product, test it out, validate that it was going to work. And then like, then they would like raise their hand after the fact. So it was like an early signal that this was like an enterprise qualified account. If they like quickly like ramped up and then dialed down their usage of the product. Yeah. It's really interesting. You see that like sort of like initial spike, um, especially if they're using multiple features of the product. I think that's, that's maybe the biggest mm. qualifier around that spike is like, well, if they're just using like one part of the product, right. But if they really go deep and maybe they like workshop it out and say like, yeah, I'm really going like to go deep on this product. I'm going to see exactly how I can use all the features and really learn it as deeply as I can in a short period of time so that I can socialize it internally. I think what's what's uh, fascinating mm. around providing the business case there, right, is like maybe there's a potential motion, and this is just this is just an idea, but maybe there's the potential motion to help present the business case from within the product itself, right, along with, um, you know, a social share or sharing, you know, documents or you know pushing those those uh, <clears throat> those established workflows that may be established uh, in the product itself, how can you then sort of weave that? And maybe this is a use case for generative AI is weaving that into a business case and speaking about those various resources that have been established in the product and then surfacing that out to executive leadership or uh, ultimately the decision makers who would approve budget. Right. Yeah. What is that enterprise sales motion? Yeah. Like what? So the output of that would be almost like a, like I've seen like a summarization email of like, you know, here's your, you know, here's the integrations that you've connected. Like here's the like uh, estimated ROI of like time saved. Uh, it was, is like a generator report or something that like, um, like yeah. is produced in the product. Like, can you share a little bit more about that example there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it could be that it could also be like the argument around like, you know, a back of the napkin ROI uh, calculation, right? That a, a salesperson would do otherwise, right? Like there's no reason that you couldn't necessarily automate that that potential calculation based off of the data that you see within the product itself. Uh, so I think that that's kind of the idea is that it could, it, and it's almost like, um, I would say a, a, a dynamic form letter, right? Yeah. Because to at least provide that base level of, Hey, you know, we see that, you know, you're doing this, this, and this, and maybe it runs, you, you could potentially run a questionnaire to the, the user who's trying to establish that business case to sort of create the additional context around that business case and then generate it for them so that they could then go and sell on your behalf. And then, I mean, shout out to uh, Nate Nezrella, right? Like, you know, in terms of selling with, um, you know, and, and his specialty and his book, like really talk about that is, you know, in empowering that sale to occur without you in the room. I feel like I got to get this book. I haven't, I uh, admittedly haven't checked it out yet, and it's come up twice in the last 24 hours. So that's probably right? a signal that I need to check it out. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One other, sure. like, yeah, one one way that we're uh, we've been testing um, kind of that like output of like this is the value that the product is bringing with with Common Room is um, because there's like all these conversations happening uh, in different like Slack channels on different like social channels and stuff like that that people are ingesting into Common Room. We are actually you mentioned AI, we are using the like, and it's been, 
you know, 40 minutes until we uh, mentioned AI. So that's like a pretty big win. But um, <laughs> yeah, right. We didn't, yeah. We didn't just default we didn't to it. Okay, kick cool. off with AI and just <laughs> let it take over. Uh, but right. we are like summarizing, like, here's the topics that people in your product are are talking about. Here's um, here's like different like sentiment and like, you know, GPT does like a pretty good job of summarizing all of that data in like a email digestible format, which is, you know, people are loving it so far. I don't know if like intrinsically has all that much value. It's like, what would you do differently with it? But people are like, wow, this is really cool. I love the summary, you know? So I'm sure there's ways that people will operationalize and like take, take that and run with it. But seeing good, impressive, like uh, wow factor kind of signals from our, from our customers on that stuff. So um, yeah, that's yeah. super cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, do you, yeah, is this the I, last... think, I think that, oh, yeah. no, uh, yeah, I mean the no that that's uh, I think the last slide that I just oh, there you go. Yeah. out and this kind of yeah this kind of goes back to the traditional co dynamic scoring aspect or you know really looking at your ICP uh, as compared to qualification criteria in terms of intent or engagement um, and and really looking at you know high fit versus low fit and you know really what would you do if you had PQLs or PQAs that basically qualified but then weren't necessarily a, a a high fit right and i think what's what's interesting is um again this kind of closes the loop and pushes back to the conversation um at the product development level is if you have individuals or accounts that really um aren't really a high fit but they're super engaged you either have one of two scenarios you have a false positive right and somebody's just like you know fan fan personing out on you um or they you you may have potential use cases that you haven't thought of so i think that this is an interesting thing is that if you see low fit uh in terms of icp combined with high qualification in terms of intent then that's something that you probably want to surface to your product team and really dig deeper on that data and how are those particular organizations or those particular individuals using the product um, as you may have in a, a completely different adjacent or undiscovered ICP there. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I never thought about that way. It's like, yeah, this low fit but high engagement could be like a completely market that you're, a completely different market that you're missing out on potentially. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it opens up the door to pull that cycle all, all over again. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, thank you. I mean, really just, you know, happy to take it to Q&A. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn um, and Strava because uh, you can find me there too. Oh, yeah. And always just want to like uh, hype, hype the aspect of uh, work-life balance and, uh, you know, appreciate, appreciate everybody listening. So, uh, you know, hope to see you on the road. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Um, we have uh, we might have some questions coming in. I have, I do have like another follow up question for for myself, um, which is uh, yeah. So one of the, the one of the things I've noticed with you know, especially with like a CDP, uh, in like the right the product teams like just tracking like every single bit of data <laughs> is that like if you push that data into Salesforce or like into a tool like that one, they, you know, they might not be able to handle it, but also like, it's pretty overwhelming for reps to just be like, what is all this data? What does this mean? So I'm wondering if you have kind of like a guidelines for like what exactly you hand over to the sales team or what intent you show them and how to like package that up. Cause I feel like it's a like analysis paralysis problem if you don't do that. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, you know, we would do at Mad Kudu is we'd really look at statistical significance of the signal. Right. And, you know, if, if signals were statistically significant in their correlation to conversion, then you do want to surface that. Right. But you don't necessarily want to overwhelm somebody with something that that's too, um, uh, that's too voluminous. Right. So I think you also have the aspect of aggregations, right. And looking at, you know, X amount of occurrences of a particular action within a certain period of time. Right. And looking at that aggregation and the correlation of that, that at the conversion level or the target level. Right. And looking at how did those play out as opposed to just the individual action by itself. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, uh, I just have one more question. Oh, actually, Danny mentioned that. Can you uh, share the slides? Are you comfortable sharing the yeah, slides? Yeah, ha do that. Happy to share the slides. Uh, let me actually. I have it pulled up right here. Grab... Actually, if it works. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yep. We got okay. it. Nice. Right um, okay. Hopefully, super... they can download that, but I don't know. Like, uh, we'll, we'll, if you, if you can't we'll share it, we'll every. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll send the recording and all the like resources yeah. and stuff like that in the in the follow up yeah. email. Um, I, we don't have a super uh, inquisitive audience today, but I have one last question and then maybe we can call it since we're at time already right now. But yeah, um, sure. the other, in addition to like, you know, a fire hose of data, sending that data to your sales team, there's also the opposite problem of, you know, sales teams knowing that like there's data locked up somewhere and I need access to it. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any like tips for people to, you know, how do you, how do you unlock the data? How do you make the case to like get, get the sales team access to this data? I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really a collaborative exercise. I think this is one of the things that, that if you have data that, especially, I mean, look at, look at your, look at the way your product is priced and sold, right? Especially at the enterprise level. And I think this goes to, you know, the PLS motion is really in terms of that enterprise approach and how that relates to product led, you want to make sure that um, if there's any aspect of how you're pricing your product or how you're tiering your product that you are able to get data that leads to informing decisions around that or how you establish the the purchase mix for the price for the customer so i i would say this is actually a great example we i at Mad Kudo, I worked with a couple of companies and I won't, won't name names, but, you know, just organizations that had product data that didn't mean anything. Like it mm -hmm. was like, you know, X3102. You're like. So naming well, convention is. is yeah, it's like, the, 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 yeah, they, like there's no naming convention on their product tags, right? You're like, okay, well, cool. There's seven occurrences of X3102. Like, you're like, I, I don't know what that is. And where where does that data dictionary exist and work with the product team right product led sales the product team and the sales organization to establish a naming convention and a data dictionary that makes sense so that that translation can occur and then once that data pipe is established that you know really they're able to get the data that would help them make decisions around how to potentially uh service and and inform the customer yeah, you're bringing me back to my segment days and having events with action object oriented like naming conventions and like that being drilled into me. So uh, I appreciate that. Um, uh, I very much appreciate naming conventions, especially on the marketing ops side of things too. It's like you, that's the only way to scale, really. But that's a whole separate uh, webinar, I guess. Um, I know, right? Like, I, I think there was a whole session at Mopsapalooza about naming conventions, actually, and I was like, that's deep. You're going deep. <laughs> yeah, super deep and super important. Uh, yeah, I'm it. Anyway, uh, well, well, Drew, thanks so much. Uh, uh, we'll uh, follow up all the recording and then do more promotion and distribution uh, around this because uh, it's kind of like a podcast format that we run into. So um, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, we'll leave it at that. See you, everyone. Awesome. Bye. Cheers. Thanks, all.